group that's, uh, of, of entities that are called the Watchers. <clears throat> then there's also something called the Sons of God. And many people have mistaken Sons of God in the Bible for angels. Angels are spirit entities. Sons of God, according to the old Jewish tradition and Christian and the Islamic world, recognize that the sons of God is different than angels. Sons of God are, in, uh, are entities, not from here, but who look like us. They look like humans, but they're not fully human. They merely look like us. And I am of the opinion that the reason why that is is because <clears throat> they made us in their image and likeness. And so we say they look like us. No, in fact, we look like them. They made us in their image and likeness. And when you read in the Bible in the beginning, which I will be showing you, when it said God created man uh, and, and God created man, in point of fact, the Bible does not say God created man. It's not saying that at all. It's saying that God has recreated man. You'll see all of this in the scriptures, but the point I want to make here for this whole presentation is that we are the product of a higher civilization who is watching us, and they are the ones that we have talked about for thousands of years as the gods. The Greeks had their gods, the Babylonians had their gods, all the ancient cultures talked about they who have come down from above, the gods they were supernatural, but they looked like men. They, they, they were messing around with women, but they were not from here. They were supernatural. I think there's something to that. I think that's very true, and I think that they're still messing around with us today. So I want to make the difference. I want the difference to be made in your mind between angels and sons of God. Angels are spirits. Sons of God look like us. They are physical beings. <clears throat> so let's start with... Um, the Companion Bible. People ask me, what Bible do you use? There's only, I've got a, a, probably a copy of every Bible that's ever been printed. But the one I particularly like is called the Companion Bible. Because it has all of the information in there that no other Bible will tell you. They've got all the stuff in there that uh, other Bibles pass over and will not tell you the real truth. The Companion Bible does. Uh, in the book of Genesis, first book of the Bible... There's a lot of interesting footnotes on each page dealing with each uh, the scriptures, and then there's a lot of footnotes. So in Genesis, the very book, the very first book of the Bible, it says, "In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth." But that's not what it says in the original. In the original, it doesn't say God created the heavens and the earth. This is a mistranslation. In the original, it says, "In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth." Elohim is not God. El is God, Elohim is plural. It's a feminine plural, adding on to the word El. El is God, Elohim is plural. So the correct translation should be, in the beginning, the gods created the heavens and the earth. And next is a very important misunderstanding in Scripture. It says, and the earth was without form and void. First of all, think about it. Why would God create the earth and it's without form and void? What does that mean? That's another mistranslation. Because the people who translated the King James Bible were very good with the King's English, but they didn't know that much about ancient Hebrew or the ancient Phoenician language. So they made some mistakes in their translations. So in the beginning, the gods, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, when you read it correctly, to understand Genesis 1, 28, we first of all have to look at Genesis 1, 2, in which the word is tohu vavohu. In the beginning, let's see, and the earth was without form and void. Correctly translated, it is not was without form and void, but you'll see in the footnotes, it became. Was is actually the word became. And without form is waste. And void is... Uh, is connected to waste, waste and a void. So what I'm saying is that when you read in the Bible, the earth was without form and void, and no, the earth became a waste and a desolation. It wasn't formed 
tohu vavohu, but it became tohu vavohu, or it became a waste and a desolation. That's interesting. So I'll go, going back to this quickly, and the earth was without form and void, was without form and void in Hebrew is the word tohu vavohu, which means became a waste and a desolation. And so this uh, word tohu vavohu means uh, it became a waste and a desolation, but this word is only used in the Bible twice. Once in Genesis 1-2, we find tohu vavohu. Also in Jeremiah 4.23, when Jeremiah 4.23, we're told that Jeremiah is given a vision by God of the world that was before mankind was on the earth. And here in uh, Jeremiah, it says, And I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. Here in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah says, I was given a vision by God, and I saw the earth, and the earth, and he goes on to say, I beheld the earth, and it was low, it was without form and void. I beheld, and lo, there was no man. So he saw the earth when there was no mankind on the earth. But it goes on to say, I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down. And it goes on to say that all the, the, the uh, birds, on number 25, I beheld and there was no man and all the birds of the heavens were fled and all the cities thereof were broken down. So he's talking about animals, birds, and beautiful cities and they were all broken down, but there was no man. And so you, be, you have to ask the question, what are you talking about? That there were cities and animals and birds, but there was no man. Well, actually in the Hebrew no man. Mankind wasn't here. So I'm saying I totally believe that that's true. That mil millions of years ago, this earth was a landing place, was a meeting place for what the Hebrews called the Elohim, the gods who came here and had cities. And those are, I mean, the, I've got many different multiple translations uh, from different translations that say basically the same thing. All the cities were broken down, uh, the, and then the birds, the birds were gone. So the point being is that in the Old Testament, we're seeing that there are cities where the Elohim, the gods, resided. Now when you hear that, uh, that, that the Hebrew religion is the only, or uh, the very first monotheistic religion. Mono, of course, meaning one, the worship of one God. In point of fact, that's not true. The Hebrew religion is henotheology, henotheistic, not monotheistic. Heno, look it up in any religious dictionary, you will see that the worship of one God is not monotheistic. The word is henotheistic, which means picking one God out of, out, out of a group, out of many. So in Hebrew theology, when you hear that the Jews were the first monotheistic religion, no, not monotheistic. The Hebrews always have many, many gods, but they picked one in particular and to worship, and that was Yahweh, one in particular. So you could say that they were the worshipers of one God, but they picked that one God from many others, and they were all equal, the gods were. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. No, it's in the beginning, the gods created the heavens and the earth. And also in Psalms 82... It says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. So it shows that the Hebrew God is judging among the many gods. He's just one of them. And then the footnote talks about the Hebrew word Elohim. Within the gods, within the congregation of the mighty, which is the gods, the assembly of many gods. So the Hebrews merely picked one of the many gods that were available. Um, and then it's interesting, now it makes sense in Genesis 128 when it says that God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. I used to correspond many years ago with Rabbi Marvin S. Antelman, who at that time was the uh, head of one of the largest rabbinical associations in the United States. And I used to correspond with him all the time, and we talked about this particular scripture. This is back in the early 60s. And I asked him about this scripture, 
because I knew that God is Elohim, the plural, and he said, yes, he said, but Christians and Jews do not read this correctly. It's not saying God created man. Read the scripture correctly. It says, come, let us. Well, now, now it's explained, let us, because there's more than one God. And the gods are saying, come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Not making man, but come, let us make him in our image, after our likeness. So it's remaking him. <clears throat> Now, the image and likeness. Image and likeness means we're in the likeness of our image or the Elohim. And in any case, the image likeness is physical. So what it's saying is that the gods who created us, this is in the ancient Hebrew, actually created us in their image and likeness. Why? Because what we were before that was the Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon man, or whatever the, these hominids were called, and now today we're a totally different kind of creature. And as I said, it's always depicting the stories in the Bible, God is always depicted as looking like a human. As a matter of fact, you know, it says that God walked in the, in the cool of the evening with Adam. The very word Hebrew, in the, as it's used in the Bible, when it says God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening, the word walk is a Hebrew word which means you can hear the footsteps on leaves. You can hear the footsteps of somebody following you. That's what the Hebrew word implied. So when it says that God walked with Adam and Eve, the Hebrew word actually means you could hear him walking with you. He's walking behind you or walking next to you. So, I mean, it's not going to be some nebulous divine God in the sky. No, it's an actual God who's created and he's walking with you in the garden. So God makes Adam. Here's a statue of uh, Adam and God together. They they're both look like human. And then they said, uh, the next one says, And God, the Lord God said, Behold, man has become as one of us. So now once he's been remade, uh, which is obviously uh, saying that the gods have tampered with our DNA. They somehow or another procreated with us and crossbred with us, which is what Zachariah Sitchin and, and all these other writers that I have worked with are saying the same thing that the gods have done something with us and changed our DNA and made us look more like they do. So now they can roam about in, uh, around us and we will never know who they are because they look like us. No, we look like them. And it's my opinion. I think we're being run on the earth by these entities who look like us. Even in the Quran, talks about how we created you, O oh mankind. Uh, and throughout the uh, Quran, talks about the gods, we, who have created you. And uh, on the bottom paragraph, it goes on to say um, that it shows how God made Adam in his own image. He formed his body from dust, just like the potter is able to make pictures from clay. So God is, uh, is talked about as being the great potter who molded us. In uh, Isaiah 64, it says, But now, O Lord, thou art our father, and we are the clay, and thou art thou our potter, and we are the works of thy hand. Well, even in the Egyptian uh, religion, mankind was pictured as being uh, designed by a great potter on the potter's wheel, implying that the gods created us. We are an experiment, a test tube experiment from a higher dimension and so when we talk to Christians and Jews we'll tell you about God go back and look at the original word God Elohim it's tr correctly translated the gods so where was uh, the creature Adam or man formed in the first book of the Old Testament it does not say God created man in the Garden of Eden Christians will tell you that Adam was formed in the Garden of Eden he was not he was it says, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed as a potter. So Adam was not formed in the Garden of Eden. He was formed somewhere, but eventually put into the garden. The Bible book of Genesis, there is a story of the flood of Noah's day, in which God seeks to wipe out all mankind by a great deluge. After the flood, is over, Noah and his family and three sons and their wives, eight people are left on the earth. 
Then God says to Noah and his family, and this is in the book of Genesis, the ninth chapter. This is after the flood of Noah's day. And God is talking to Noah, uh, who has been saved with this, uh, with this family. And it says, God blessed Noah. This is chapter 9. God blessed Noah and his sons and said to him, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. And I have asked many rabbis over the years. I used to hang out at the Solomon Wiesenthal Center for Holocaust Studies and sit and dicker with the uh, rabbis all day long, talking to them about their concepts and, and what they were interpreting these scriptures to mean. And, they, and the rabbis have said, replenish is a correct word, because I asked them about that word, replenish. Re means do again. Well, obviously, if the, you know, if the earth has been wiped out, all human life has been wiped out uh, from a flood, if you want more people on the earth, you're going to have to replenish the earth. So that makes sense. But back in chapter 1, when God is creating Adam and Eve, back in chapter 1, it says, this is 128, and God blessed Adam and Eve and blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. This is in chapter 1 when God is creating the first human pair and told to replenish the earth. Do it again. So, there's another story in the Old Testament that is also part of this general subject. Adam and Eve's first two sons, Cain and Abel, where, where we read that Cain killed his brother Abel. It's in the Bible. It says that Cain talked with his brother Abel, his brother, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, Cain rose up and killed Abel, his brother. Um, and Cain said, I think I may have it. Yes. Here is Cain uh, killing his brother in the Bible in Genesis. But uh, it says in the scripture, in yellow says, And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. This is after he's killed his brother. And he says, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken upon him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest anyone finding him shall kill him. So the point here is that we have Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, the first couple, the first humans on the earth, and their two sons. So now you got Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, and Cain just killed his brother, and God is putting him out, kicking him out, because he's a murderer, and Cain is saying to God, you know, don't put me out there because anyone finding me will kill me. So even Cain thinks there's somebody else out there that's been out there a long time, and don't put me out there because they'll kill me. What do you mean they, they will kill me? Who else would be there? I thought that it was just Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. No, Cain's saying, don't put me out there because there's others out there who will kill me. So the others were obviously the pre-Adamic man or the ones we call hominids, the hominid creatures from which we know that they exist because we're still finding the skeletons everywhere. So Adam and Eve are a recreation from the hominid creatures to the humans that we are today. We can't, we can't begin to live like the hominids did. We have to have clothes. We have to be kept warm. We don't have the kind of skin they have. We don't have the same blood type that they can live in the, in the wilds at night. We can't. It's because we've been recreated in the image of the gods who came here. So there's a difference between the ancient hominid creatures and we humans today. Now let's go back to the flood of Noah's day. Uh, in the flood of Noah's day, we see that I be, uh, the scripture says in Genesis, I behold and even do bring a flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein there breathes life. And from under the heavens and everything that is on the earth shall die. So we know in the Bible there's a story of the flood of Noah's day that destroyed all life on the earth. And over here in Genesis 7, it says something very interesting. In the 600th year of Noah's life, Second month, 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rains were upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. 
But people think the great flood was caused by the rains for 40 days and 40 nights. Any scientist will tell you, uh, no matter how bad the rain is, no matter how widespread, it's not going to fill the earth and cover the earth in 40 days and 40 nights. No. It may be you know, 12, 14 inches, but it's not going to cover the earth. Impossible. And it's impossible for the whole earth to be covered with water, period, anyway. That's totally scientifically impossible. But it's interesting when you really look at the scriptures, it says in the 600th year of Noah's life, second month, 17th day, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, meaning that there was some kind of a tremendous earthquake. And that's probably what the scripture was talking about in, in uh and Jeremiah when he says, I saw beautiful cities. And then all of a sudden it was tohu vavohu. All of a sudden it was a waste and a desolation. Well, yeah, if you get a 14 on the Richter scale in Los Angeles, 10 times worse than anything that's ever happened, it's going to be a waste and a desolation everywhere. Maybe that's what Jeremiah was talking about, that there were great cities that the gods had created. But if it was a great, some kind of a hellacious earthquake, it would have destroyed those cities and people. Which brings up the subject, of course, of Atlantis, because that's the story of Atlantis. Atlantis was a great and godly kind of place with high spiritual beings from other worlds, we're told. They were supernatural creatures, and they lived in this area called Atlantis. And then it says, and all the, the great fountains of the deep were broken up. Well, if they were broken up, you see going down the middle of the Atlantic is a earthquake fault. That's a big one. It's like the San Andreas Fault. And the U.S. Navy has photographed the ocean's bottoms for military purposes. But it's interesting, they photographed the Great Fault going down through the Atlantic Ocean. So it very well could have been great civilizations or islands out there. And this fault went, and when it did, it took with it all civilization that was at that time. Incidentally, on the floor of the Atlantic Ocean today, 10 miles north of Bimini, the last little island in the, uh, in the, the Bermuda Triangle uh, of islands, 10 miles north of Bimini, the island of Bimini, is called the Bahama Banks. And in the Bahama Banks is a huge pyramid with an all-seeing eye at the top, larger than the pyramid in Egypt sitting on the ocean floor. U.S. Navy has taken pictures of it. They've had stories and books written about it. There's a huge pyramid with an all-seeing eye sitting on the ocean floor 10 miles north of Bimini in the Atlantic Ocean. I don't know what that's all about, but it's out there, and nobody's tried to explain it. So something's going on in, in uh, Atlanta. Something was going on in the Atlantic. The whole concept of undersea kingdoms have always been around, even scholarly articles about underground bases, underwater bases, uh, even the movie Abyss, the very word abyss in the Bible, the Bible word abyss means watery deep. So it says the, angel, the, the devil comes out of the abyss or the, angel, the demons come out of the abyss. The word abyss in the Bible is water. So here we have uh, great temples that are found all around the world under the oceans. These are, this is in the Bahama, this is in the Bermuda Triangle. Uh, even from the satellite, looking down on the Atlantic, uh, you will see some kind of a configuration. Looks like a, a perfect square, and looks like a division of land. This is on the on the floor of the Atlantic Ocean from the uh, from the satellite. Most people don't even know this stuff out in the Pacific and in the Atlantic. I mean, that. Uh, could very well have been some kind of a great civilization, uh, but it's underwater now. And of course, as I said, we know there are many temples all around the world that are covered with water. Off the coast of Cuba, there are whole temples and, and uh, artifacts. And then, of course, off the coast of uh, Japan, there are huge temples buried. So it implies that you know we've had civilizations on this earth for millions of years that you don't know anything about. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, the oceans were not where they are now. That's why we have great deserts in North Africa. The deserts are the floor of the ocean. 
after the salt settled down and nothing could grow, they became deserts. So there must have been some kind of a monstrous displacement of, of, uh, of land and water hundreds of thousands of years ago, millions of years ago, who knows. But the point is that these temples that are underwater are there and were built by ancient civilizations. We are not the pinnacle of, of success on the earth. And we are not the smartest. We are degrading. We are degenerating. We're not evolving. We are de you know, we're devolving. So because the people who built the pyramids and the tombs and all of these artifacts in Egypt and around the world were far smarter than we'll ever be. So we are merely seeing the relics of a higher civilization that were here and now are under the ocean. Incidentally, in relation to that, while we're on the subject of temples in the ocean, two scriptures come to mind. The bottom one, of course, is uh, Hebrews Old Testament 26, 5, and the top one is in the Christian New Testament, Mark 5, 1 through 15. In the Bible, in um, Job, the oldest book in the Bible in the Old Testament is Job. And um, that's where we get our word job. Your job is a very depressing thing. Well, that's what the story of Job was, a very depressing thing. Yeah. So that's where we get our word job from Job. But anyway, in the book of Job 26, this is the Old Testament, it says... Dead things are formed from under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. Over in the, uh, on the right-hand side is the, um, uh, the footnote. It says, dead things are formed from under the waters, uh, which is translated, the place where the repium stay, which is beneath the waters and the things that are therein. What are you talking about, dead things? The dead things is the Hebrew word repium are the offspring of fallen angels akin to the Nephilim. So there are, according to the Bible, Old Testament, there are offspring of the angels or the sons of God, these creatures who have come here millions of years ago and procreated, and their offspring are able to live underwater in the oceans. So that might explain why you're seeing UFOs coming out of the oceans, a lot of activity over the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean, because even the Bible said dead things is repium, the offspring of fallen angels akin to the Nephilim or the Anunnaki. So I'm just saying it is at least possible that we have high civilizations from other worlds who are now living on the ocean floor in the Atlantic and Pacific because they can live there. We can't. They're called the Elohim, or as Zechariah, my friend Zechariah Sitchin says, the Anunnaki. We don't know what they're capable of, but obviously they are far superior to anything they've created, which is us. Over here on, uh, and then of course, like I said, in the New Testament, it's in the book of Mark, has an interesting point here. It says, and when Jesus is brought before, Jesus comes in contact with a man who is mentally deranged and it says that he was filled with demons and devils and it says here in 12 and all the devils besought Jesus saying send us into the swine that we may enter into them if you remember that story where Jesus confronts a crazy man a, a wild man and he says what is your name and the man says I am legion we are a legion and the scripture goes on to say that there was all kinds of devils in this man and they talked back to Jesus, not the man, but these spirit entities in the man were talking to Jesus. And they said, we are a legion. And it said, the unclean spirits, Jesus said, gave them leave. So Jesus told the unclean spirits of the demons in the man to get out of him, leave him. And it says, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And, heard, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and they were choked in the sea. So that's an old biblical story about Jesus chasing the demons out of a man, and they wanted to go into some kind of life forms because they had to be in some kind of a life form. So Jesus sent them into the pigs. But immediately the pigs ran into the ocean and, and died. I'm thinking, wait a minute, if in, if in the pigs... Uh, there are spirit entities, and, and they are trying to get back into water. 
And so when the pigs went into the water, the pigs died. The spirits are now in water where they operate best. Well, electricity travels good in water. Water is a very good conductor of electricity, or, and electricity is a part of the human spirit. So I'm just saying, there could very well be that there were spirits who wanted to get back to the ocean if they couldn't be in a man. And uh, let the God say, the man has become as one of us. This is the beginning of the Neanderthal period or the, uh, or the what we call the ancient cavemen. But then from there, we have a mutation of the human race. Something new is being created. And we even have those concepts now in movies and television about a whole alien nation being created to look like humans. And again, I'm drawing the difference between, I'm, I'm pointing out the difference between angels and sons of God. In the book of Hebrews, it says God makes his angels spirits. So we know that angels are spirit entities, demons or ghosts or whatever else you might want to call them. Ghosts are spirits. They have no bodies. But sons of God are different. Sons of God, they're just pictured here, but they actually physical entities that can procreate with humans. And we know that these entities that look like humans, but they're called sons of God. And in the Bible, they took all the women they wanted, procreated, had the offspring called Nephilim. And uh, here it is again in Genesis 6. They're called the sons of God. The sons of God are not angels. And it said that, the, that there were giants in the earth in those days, back in Genesis. And that, uh, there were giants in the earth in those days. And after that... When the sons of God came to the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, and some became mighty men, which are of old, the men of renown. So these sons of God were able to procreate with, with women, which showed that their, their plumbing worked the same way as a man. So there was not some spirit entity or ghost. No, it was actual grown men who were procreating with women. But those men were not fully men. They were sons of God. The Elohim or the Anunnaki that, uh, that is being talked about now. They were the gods who came here from another place in the universe who looked like us and created us and now we look like them and therefore they can now operate in public all around us and you will never know who they really are. And so when I see these people who are in charge and power and they're always in power and they hold absolute sovereign power over the earth, I'm beginning to wonder who are these people? Because obviously they're not human. They don't care about killing people, murdering. They don't care about nothing but their agenda. So I'm saying it's my belief that we are being manipulated and exploited and ruled by extraterrestrials who look like us. No, we look like them. Remember in Genesis 8, 18 where Abraham is confronted by three men? The scripture says in Genesis 18, and the Lord appeared to Abraham. And it says, and he lifted up his eyes and looked. Three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran out to meet them and said, my Lord, uh, if now I've found favor in your sight, pass not away, I pray thee from your servant. And let a little water, I pray you'll be fetched. Wash your feet and rest yourselves. And over here in the, in the, on 8, it says he took butter, milk, and calf which was dressed and set it before them and he sat and he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. The story in Genesis 18 is very important, I think. It talks about Abraham being confronted by three men who walked up into his camp. And these three men said that they were on their way someplace on business, but Abraham insisted that they at least stay and he would have them fix something to eat and they could rest for a little bit and then they could go. And they said, no, they were busy and they were on their way, and he insisted. So the Bible says that they, uh, they finally relented and said, all right, we're going to stay for dinner, but make it quick because we're on our way somewhere. So it says that, uh, you know, so he took butter and milk and a calf, which he had dressed, and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree as they did eat dinner. So he's feeding these three men. Then you find out later on that these three men was actually... The three, they were not three ordinary men. Uh, you come to find out that that's Abraham standing. The three men, one of them is the creator God, the one called Yahweh, Jehovah. 
the Creator God with two accompanying angels. The Bible goes on to say that there were three men who looked like men, but there was actually the Almighty Creator with two accompanying angels. And afterwards, that's in Genesis 18, but in Genesis 19, those two, if you remember the story in Genesis 18, it says that two of the men got up and left, but one of them stayed to stay a little bit longer with Abraham while the other two left. And they said the one that stayed was the almighty God, the creator, the one who was actually created humans. But the other two were his accompany, uh, uh, angels or sons of God. And they ended up going into Sodom and Gomorrah. And so in 19 it says, so there came two angels to Sodom and Gomorrah. And um, <clears throat> again, they were given something to eat. In the, in the, and so in the story in Sodom and Gomorrah, the homosexuals saw these two men and thought they were beautiful, handsome men and wanted to have sex with them. If you remember, that's in Genesis 19. And so they were obviously handsome, good-looking men. They were not spirit entities that, that looked like ghosts. No, they were actual men. And, but they were called sons of God. And, of course, they, uh, if you go on with the story in the book of, of uh, Genesis 19, it talks about how the, the sons of God, these good-looking, handsome men, finally put an end to all that crap going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. But they were not angels. They looked like humans. Uh, so, you have uh, Abraham talking to three men who actually was God and two helpers. Uh, yeah, the Apostle Paul, that was all in the Old Testament, book of Genesis. Now, in the New Testament, uh, in Hebrews 13, 2, the Apostle Paul uh, is saying something very interesting in, in Hebrews 13. The Apostle Paul said, Be not fearful and fearful forgetful to entertain strangers, thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Again, mistranslation of angels should be sons of God. But what the Apostle Paul is writing is he said, uh, always be hospitable to all men that you meet, for some have entertained sons of God and didn't know it. So that's something to keep in mind. When you're talking to someone, you never know who you're talking to. Because there's too many cases have been reported where some woman had a bad accident and was dying or someone was under a car and out of nowhere a man comes up to help her, picks the car up or helps the child up and saves their life and then the woman turns around to thank them and they're gone. There's way too many examples of, of entities walking out of nowhere, coming out of nowhere, helping a human and instantly are gone. But they looked like men, and they were able to pick up a car. So they must have been very strong men. So they were looked like men. They had the strength of a man or super strength, but they looked like men. That's the point. They were not spirit entities. They, they looked like us. So now comes the idea of men who are ruling us who have a divine right of kings. This whole idea of divine right is ludicrous. Because some of these entities who have come here figure they have a divine right because they've created us. Well, in a manner of speaking, the father and mother creates the son or daughter. But that doesn't mean they own the son and daughter forever. The son and the daughter are, are humans and they have their own life to live. So the same thing is true with us. Here it says, um, the, this, let's see, alternatively, they may have magic weapons, gain power of, of obtaining gifts and spirits, stealing and merit, some divine secret. Nevertheless, their wisdom may give them a role of teachers and lawgivers, bringing to mankind rules of society, arts, and skills of civilization. In this function, they may appear as ancestors, founders of a society, and ideal rulers of priests. What this article was saying is that Somewhere or another, gods have appeared on the earth who have led us and taught us, taught us uh, astrology. They've taught us all of our sciences. They have continually taught us how to govern, how to make money, how to form governments. They've set up our religions. The whole entire human system on the earth is obviously operating at a very high level. Uh, intelligence, somebody is ruling us through our institutions of 
of churches, synagogues, mosques, uh, our governmental systems, banking systems. Somebody has set this world up to control us humans, and they look like us. So we accept them as just humans doing it. No, it's not necessarily humans who are running the earth. They are referred to as heroes with divine blood. And here are some of the phonies who think they are heroes of divine blood. A bunch of dingbat scumbags. International criminals of the highest, international criminals who consider themselves to be of divine origin. But remember, when you hear that term, that kings have a divine right of kings, where does that divine right come from? It comes from the Pope, because nobody else in the world, in, in Asia and Africa, nobody else in the world has religious leaders or, or political leaders that reclaim divine right. That silly bunch of nonsense comes only out of Europe. And, now, and, it's on the, and then you can understand why that foolish and stupid idea of divine right of kings comes from the fact that Europe has been dominated for 2,500 years by Rome. Under the Caesars of Rome, he was God. And if he appoints you to be governor, you have a divine right because God put you there. Well, when, this, when the Roman Empire finally corrupted and fell apart, the Vatican came in with the Holy Father, and now he is the Pontifex Maximus who will bestow upon you a divine right to be, uh, to be a, uh, a holy man or a, what am I trying to say, uh, royalty. So this is where royalty gets their royalty from. It's from the Holy Father, the Pope. And when you find out the connection with the Vatican to all the governments of Europe and how Rome has dominated Europe, for 2,500 years, and, and uh, the Vatican has dominated Europe for 1,600 years, and Europe has dominated the world for 1,600 years, then you understand what's going on today around the world. The wars and the, and the stuff that's going on today is the wars between the gods. It's the Star Wars. The gods are warring for ownership of the human race. The Pope represents one faction of the gods. This is what Zachariah Sitchin has been talking about for years. Incidentally, I was in business with Zachariah Sitchin. And when I was in business with him, I had a lot of time I could spend with him in off hours. And we've had a lot of interesting conversations in private. And all I will tell you is that there's more to Zachariah Sitchin than meets the eye. This guy is not only a brilliant writer, but he's a far more well-informed than you think he is. He just hasn't told you the whole story yet. But uh, there they are. Dingbat, goofball, the whole bunch of them. Yeah. And so in the book of, and so in the New Testament, we're told, well, I mean, you've got to look at this dimwit. Look at this. Yeah, collectively. You go over there collectively, they got an IQ of 40, the whole bunch of them. I was in England. I spoke in England to an audience of about, I'd say, five to 600 people. And I, I, and, and I said, the first day I was there was on a Saturday morning, and I said, you know, you have to appreciate I'm an American, so I have my own views on this. And I said, but last night I was in the hotel, and uh, there was a, a birthday party for Prince Charles. And the Queen Mother came out, and, uh, and everyone fall all over themselves and slobbered all over themselves. And, <laughs> and I said, and made a fool out of themselves. But uh, she then introduced her son for the birthday party, and he came out and, and, and said to her, thank you, mummy. And I said, I thought that was interesting. And everyone and all the English were laughing because Prince Charles calls his mother mummy. And I said on the stage, I said, that woman looks like a mummy. <laughs> and if you put a $10,000 dress on her, she still looks like a mummy. And then I said to the audience, I've got this on tape, I said, how long are you people here in England going to put up with this bunch of bull? <laughs> While people crawling on their knees trying to pay their rent and starving, these people are driving around in golden chariots, calling each other mummy, and they got a divine right. When in the hell are you people going to wake up and have a revolution? <laughs> yeah. 
I have no respect for anybody who puts themselves above any other human. We're all created by the same God. But, and, and then the Apostle Paul goes on to say, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we're not at war with government. We're at war with these Elohim, these ancient gods who've been manipulating the human race. I've had enough of them. Interesting. Um, I think we've got a few minutes here, but you might want to read um, Don Juan, Carlos Castaneda's book, where Don Juan talks about the, the gods who are creating us. I'm not going to go through this because it's too long. But just go and read Don Juan, where Don Juan, the Mexican shaman priest, said that there are aliens who look like us in his book. Carlos Castaneda's books are very famous. But he said in his book that Don Juan, the Mexican uh, uh, spirit teacher, said uh, that there are aliens who look like us, but they have been manipulating us and lying to us and tricking us with their religions, their governments, the way that we think, their education, all these systems are being controlled by aliens who look like humans, but they're not. And they're very, very dark and evil. And they're manipulating the whole human race. And they have been from day one. And I thought to myself in reading that, well, that's, that's, what, I, that's what I'm saying, the same thing. What Don Juan was, was telling Carlos Castaneda is that we are being ruled by entities from somewhere else who have created us, and maybe there are good ones who have come from out there and who see us as a creation and who realize what's going on. They know who our creators are and what they're doing to us. So there may be good uh, entities out there like us who want to help us to get out from under this silly nonsense of these. I don't care if they have created me. Once they have created me, I have my own mind, my own spirit. And it's just like a child. You know, the father and mother may have brought the child into the world, but that child is, has its own life to live, its own spirit, its own life to live. And it, has, it does not need to be uh, uh, crushed over by the parent. Well, the same thing is true for us humans. If we've been created by the gods, whoever they are, it doesn't matter. We have our own minds, our own spirits, and we need to start thinking in terms of connecting yourself and your spirit with the divine spirit of the universe, because we are the sons of God. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. about the Anunnaki being reptilian and you know I just would like to try to put all this together yeah I think that I am totally convinced for myself and this is just one man speaking but I am totally convinced for myself that there is such a thing as uh, reptile alien gods or reptile aliens not because uh, David Icke says so because I'm the one that told David Icke about it when I brought him here back in 1992. I brought, I, let me finish, I brought David Icke to America back in 1992 and I sat with him and talked with him about the aliens and the reptile aliens and I showed him all my documents on it and he got interested in it and today he's famous for talking about a subject that I told him about a long time ago. But I believe that there are reptile aliens here. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Sons of God, then no, no, but the, us, then not but no, no. But the point, as I made before, there are many different kinds of life forms out there, and maybe some of them have come here from other places in the universe, who, in, on their planets and on their system, they were they were reptilian, and they have come here, like all the other different kinds of aliens that are coming here, and they're messing with us. It's just like a party, you know, and and when the, and there's a big party, and they have party crashers. Gangs come in from other from other places that come into the party, and they're coming in and say, "Hey, these are y'all a bunch of young teenagers. We're grown men like the like a motorcycle gang, and they come in and take over everything, and take over the whole party and well, destroy everything." What about them being carnivorous and particularly with our children, all these missing children? Yeah, I know. I mean, there's there's a whole story behind that. I can take you right now. I can take you right now to Coldwater Canyon and Mulholland Drive where there are child sacrifices being done today in Studio City. I can take you to places. So they're still having uh, human sacrifice in Los Angeles right now. I can take you to where they are. Anyway, I want to thank you. Jordan, I I wanna, don't agree yet. No. Uh, 
ladies and gentlemen, I beg the, the owner of the building to let us be here until 6. Uh, we're going to be here until 6. Whoever want to go home 5 or earlier can go. And uh, uh, Mr. Andrew Bishago is here on the back. He will need one and a half hour minimum because he has a long, uh, uh, long cooked uh, PowerPoint. So uh, if we leave in 6, <coughs> we starting at 4.30, right? What time is it, Professor? Uh, 4.30. Yeah, you want to have a break for about five minutes? It's 3. We don't need a break. Yeah, it's 3. We do. We do. Uh, it's 3 o'clock. Yeah, it is 3 o'clock. Yeah. Yeah, 4.30. We'd love to be able to ask him questions. 4.15, we'll start Andrew. We might, uh, He's have, fascinating. Hold on, please. <laughs> we might have a question. We have a lot of questions and answers. I brought Andrew from Washington. He's been driving two days. Yeah. So it's not easy. His project is very long. Um, Do you have a few minutes so I can, uh, if they want to ask yeah. questions? So uh, you guys go question yeah. and answers, and then you take uh, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, again. We, can, we can come back. He can keep going on until I stop. And, and we do have another mic, so if we could either line up or just pass the mic around. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, we could turn on the lights maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll work on it. Anyway, I hope that you understand. I put this together very uh, quickly. Because I, I only found out about this uh, conference um, a couple of days before, about a week ago. So I put this presentation together very quickly. And I know it's very sporadic and kind of hard to follow. And I knew I was under the gun for time, so I was moving through it very quickly. But I'm telling you, I, there's no doubt in my mind from all the years that I have been able to talk with people in government and science and astronauts and, uh, and medical people, in my mind, there's no doubt in my mind that we have been created. We are, a, we are a test tube creation. Somebody has created us, and whoever that somebody is looks like us. So they have taken those, all those Neanderthal and the ancient uh, hominid creatures, which the world is filled with them. We know they're there because we're finding them everywhere, but they don't look like us. So we are a special creation, which is why the Bible says in Genesis, the gods said, come let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Because for being so great, it's not that great. A bunch of hairy people out there eating each other and living like animals. So let's take one of the females and procreate with her and see what comes out of a connection between the gods and, and the indigenous creatures here. So I don't think evolution is the question. It's intervention is the question. Not that we evolved, but somebody intervened in our natural evolution and came here and crossbred with the, the indigenous creatures and created us. That's why one half of human is animalistic, other half is angelic. Because there is that part, like the Apostle Paul said, there's a war in our flesh between the man that we are and the man we want to be. That makes sense because if we were like Neanderthal or Cro-Magnon man or these uh, uh, ancient hominid creatures, they live by instinct alone. Just eat, sex, fight, whatever. But now we are a different creation. We have a part of the sons of God in us. So we can now design beautiful music, build televisions and and, and go to the moon and think about the stars and have theology, philosophies, all these, and the great arts and sciences. Where did all that come from? My God, they were crawling around in caves not, not long ago. And we're walking on the moon with computers. So I'm saying that that's a part of us, is that part that the, that the DNA that they put into the humans a long time ago and were kind of bringing us along. That's why we call even humans today are called cultures. You know, they're, they're, they're in the, that's a particular culture. A culture is something on a test tube, you know what I mean? That you, yeah, so we are a culture. They have designed us. And whoever designed us, we look like them. And so in the Bible you can say, oh, well, they, they look like us. No, no, no. You look like them. They don't look like you. Why? Because they look like what you look like, where they came from. They look like what you look like now. So they have, they have intervened in your evolution. 
And so, therefore, there's that in, inside of us is that desire to know wisdom, to know the stars, to know where we've come from. And at night, you look out into the stars, you know, ask a child seven years old, where's God? He's out there. Well, well that's right, he's out there. But I hate to tell you this, if God's out there, that means he's extraterrestrial. Because if he was here from Cleveland, Ohio, it would be terrestrial. But if God's out there, it means he's extraterrestrial. He's out there. And ask where uh, angels come from. Where do angels come from? A child will tell you they're out there. They come from out in heaven. Well, yeah, walk out at night, look into, the, look into the sky. What are you looking at? Heaven. So if God is in heaven, yeah, he's out there in the stars. You'll say, yeah, I'll bet he's out there in the stars. No, he was out there in the stars. They are here. They live they're here. And I am totally convinced that that is the case. We are being ruled by extraterrestrial intelligence. These, whoever these people are who are running the earth are highly advanced in science and they're bringing us along. Little by little, they are mutating the species. They are mutating us. We were used to be back in the 20s, just regular people, poor people working. Now we're getting sophisticated with computers and Hollywood, and we're moving now into the concept of, of, of procreating with the brain and the computer, going to the moon. Uh, it's a, a whole different kind of creature is being developed right now. By who? Somebody out there is messing with us. And so I'm saying what you need to do is take back your own humanity and no longer buy into any religious system, no, no cultural systems, None of this. Start thinking for yourself. Educate your mind. Where do things come from? Where do words come from? Where do these ideas and concepts come from? I don't, I don't, I'm not buying into anybody's religion, their governments, their systems of education, none of it. I don't buy any of it. For a long time I've been questioning where do, where do we get our knowledge about anything? Somebody's manipulating us. This is why we have something called politically correct. You've got to understand, you've got to go to school and learn what you're supposed to so you can get a job and work and, and fit in with the society. I don't want to fit in with society. There's nothing about society I want to fit in with, period. I just want to call, have people start thinking for themselves and asking questions. When I was nine years old, I was, say it again. What did you say? When I was nine years old, I was, uh, I was, I was um, confirmed as a Catholic, Catholic confirmation. And the nuns told us, she said, uh, tomorrow at Sunday at church will be a confirmation uh, ceremony, and the bishop is going to be here. And it's going to be a very important time for you children. And so after the confirmation service is over tomorrow night in church, the bishop might possibly ask you if you have any questions, because now that you're Catholic, the bishop may ask you if you have any questions. Now, if that happens, you do not ask any questions ever. You sit down and shut up. You don't have any questions. <laughs> and so that's what I needed. So that night after the confirmation was over, when the confirmation was over, the bishop did say, if you children have any questions, I'll try and answer them. So I stood up to make sure they damn well know who I am. I stood up and I said, yes, I have a question. And I'm nine years old. And I said, my father works with torches, like a welder. And I said, could I take a torch and turn up the fire on the torch and burn an angel? If there was an angel here, could I burn him and hurt him? And he says, what do you mean burn an angel? I said, if I had a torch, could I burn an angel? Would it hurt him? And he said, no. You couldn't hurt an angel. I said, why not? He said, well, fire is a physical thing. It takes wood or plastic or paper or something to burn. You can't burn an angel. And I said, why not? And he said, because angels are spirits. You can't burn a spirit. And I said, well, why am I concerned about going to hell where my, my spirit will burn forever and you can't burn a spirit? <laughs> so the priest said, you? Yes, sit down and shut up. <laughs> In front of everybody. But I already knew what was going on. I already realized that adults don't know any more about the world than kids. As a matter of fact, adults can learn a lot from listening to children. Adults have already got their whole little system and routine going. 
that is nothing more than a manipulation that they've been taught in their colleges and schools. But talk to a child who's never had any of that crap in his mind, and they will ask all kinds of off-the-wall questions because they're seeing the real truth. So that's what I'm recommending humans do. Start waking up. Your brain is like a parachute. Don't work if it ain't open. So start using your mind and your brain and questioning everything, especially religion, especially government, and especially anytime someone is called an authority, because the word authority comes from author. So when they say, well, the authorities, there is no authority. My God is my authority. So I don't give a damn about authority. I don't care about government. I have no respect for religion. I got no respect for none of this whole stinking dirty system that somebody has created above us and manipulating us. I, for one, want my humanity back, and I want to make my own decisions, and I don't care what Hollywood is putting out. I don't care what's required in service, in the, in the services of this country. I don't care about any of this. I want to do my own thinking. I'll ask the questions, and I'll do my own research. And that is very serious, because now you're thought of as a revolutionary. And by God, that's what I am, and that's what I've always been. And I want to lead a revolution an intellectual, spiritual renaissance on this earth that causes people to say to the leaders of this world, no more. We're not buying it. From here on out, we're going to deal with ourselves. We're leaving you out. Church, we don't need the church. We don't need the synagogue. We don't need your government. And we sure as hell don't need the U.S. government. What we need is to get back ourselves in tune with that divine universal God force that's out there because I'm telling you, that's where the power is. I've got a whole... So that's what I intend to do with my life. I'm just trying to wake people up. That's all I want to do. Any other questions? Yeah. 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 yeah, just one question. Um, I saw a video called Ring of Power. They mentioned something that caught my, caught my attention. They basically said that the Queen of England was the most powerful uh, human in the world. When her, when her I don't think that's true. No. No, I don't think so. I think, no, I don't think so at all. I don't, I don't think the Queen has much power at all. I think she's just uh, like anything else. She's a figurehead, just like Obama. He doesn't have any power over nothing. Got nothing. He's got no power over nothing. This is a white man's country. This is a white man's world. The white man from Europe dominates the whole planet. White men go into any country and kill everybody, take over anything they want. This is a white man's country. It's a white man's world. I'm not bragging about it. I'm just telling, I'm just telling you the fact of the matter. White people out of Europe have dominated Europe and have dominated the, then Europe has dominated the world. And so England has manipulated and exploited the races, the peoples of the world. The white man has been using uh, exploitation, commerce to manipulate and exploit the whole human race. So I cannot believe that some young black guy walks in and he's going to take over the old white man's establishment on the earth. Ain't going to happen. No. They brought him in for some reason to make him look like a schmuck one of these days soon. But he is not in control. The men who are behind him is Zvignu Brzezinski. You want to find out what's going on with Obama? Do some research on Zvignu Brzezinski. Studied in Moscow. Pure Moscow communism. That's Zvignu Brzezinski. And he's the brains behind Obama. Obama's just a front man. They get rid of him like they did Kennedy. He was, a, he was a very powerful man, John Kennedy. Everybody loved him. Handsome, debonair, president of the United States, wealthy, and they shot this guy in public, and nobody went to jail. Nobody's ever going to jail. Why? Because the powers to be that run this country will kill you. You think for one minute you're going to get out of line and be important in this country, they'll, they'll whack you so thick. As a matter of fact, the California state has a, has a, I don't know if you know this or not, but the mafia have their own license plates in California. Do you know that? Yeah. The mafia is given their own license plates by the California state government. I know, because I've sat with the mob and talked with them. And they have their own license plates. <clears throat> I had a, at a time, uh, I'll, I'll give you an exam, uh, example of what I'm talking about, how government operates directly with the underworld. And there is one and the same thing. We're talking money. We're talking power. But the governor it would not look right if a governor goes out and has somebody killed. So they make a phone call, and that's taken care of. And the government doesn't know nothing about it, but they get what they want. So in payment, the government makes a contract with the mob. We don't mess with your, your business. You don't mess with ours. 
You take care of things that we need to take care of, we take care of you. That's what's going on in California. The mob has their own license plates, and the mob has a mob business deals with the state of California to take care of all the dirty work for them. So as far as I'm concerned, and I've been told by FBI agents, I had an FBI agent call me in my office in Glendale and tell me, Jordan, we've been watching you for a long time. We know what you're doing. And as of this moment, and this was quite a long time ago, about 12 years ago, but he said, as of this moment, the government, your government, does not consider you to be a threat yet. He said, but we're watching everything you do, everywhere you go, we're watching you. But we don't consider you to be a threat because people are hearing you, but they're not listening. So as long as people are hearing you, then you're all right. But when people start to listen to you, now that's different. Now we're talking politics. And so you will ha we'll have to take another look at you then. I have had federal agents talking to me about what I do. I've had FBI people talking to me about what I do. And I've been threatened by federal government. So I know what they can do. And I respect them because they will kill you. In this country, you can be killed. If you know something you're not supposed to know, or if you're talking uh, on, in, about subjects you're not supposed to talk about, they will kill you. Now, first of all, they would prefer just putting you in jail, finding some uh, misplaced comma on your income tax and send you away for 30 years. But if that's not going to work, then they'll just kill you. You'll be killed coming out of a restaurant one night, and as some lone gunman, and, 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 all the, and everybody will be there sobbing at your funeral. And, uh, but the real story is they whacked you because you shut your mouth off. You're talking too much. You know too much, and you're talking too much. So I'm saying that America is in very serious trouble because the people have not been told what's going on. They haven't been told how this world works. The world, I will give you, I'll give you some freebies. It took me 48 years to learn this. Well, let me tell you some of the secrets that I've learned. One is that nothing in this world works the way you think it does. Nothing. Nothing that you understand about this world works the way you think it does. It doesn't. Banks don't loan money. There are laws, federal laws, on the books today that say, very specifically, banks cannot loan money ever. That's the law. So what are you going to the bank to get a loan for when banks can't loan money? Logic alone would explain it to you. I'm not going to put $100,000 into a bank so that you can come in and borrow $100,000 for a new car on my money. No, thank you. You're not going to take my money to buy your car, and if you don't pay for it, I just lost 100000 That's not the way it works. No, no, banks cannot loan money. So what happens is if you buy a new car, and say it's a $40,000 car, every car, every automobile, or anything, house, motorcycle, doesn't matter what it is, it must have a, um, an appraiser appraise that property or appraise that car and so whatever that car is worth, say that car is worth $40,000, the appraiser said. So when you take that, so that paperwork is called commercial paper. And that commercial paper represents $40,000 of a business. You take that commercial paper, and when you say you want to buy this car, the car agency will take that paper and give it to the bank. The bank then takes that commercial paper, which represents $40,000, and opens up a bank account in your name. And it will forge your name. It will forge your signature, because you can't open a bank account unless the person opening it signs it. So they will forge your name on a bank account, but they don't tell you that. Then they take the $40,000 commercial paper and deposit it in the, in the uh, account, the new account that they just opened for you. Because if you have a ring worth $40,000 and you get it appraised for forty, dollars you can walk into the bank and tell the bank president, I want to deposit this ring and here's the paperwork on it. It's worth $40,000. I want to deposit that in my account. And they will take the ring and they will then put $40,000 in your account. Now you've got forty grand in your account to do it, but they got your ring. And they know it's worth 40000 so they're not worried. They just give you credit. They do that yeah. And so, therefore, the bank never loaned you anything. They just took the commercial paper, put it into a bank account, and then they wrote a check on it. Because, after all, now you've got $40,000 in the bank, so now they write a check on it and give it to you, and you give it to the car agency. So you've paid them. No, no, you didn't pay them anything. Nobody paid anybody anything. Let me explain something to you. Suppose... You are a 
a, a painter, and I and I hire you to paint my office, and you say that the, it will be a hundred dollars, and I agree to that. After the job is over, as a contractor, the way commerce is operating in commerce, you come to me and you give me a bill for a hundred dollars. I look at it. I agree to I agree to to this bill. So I owe you $100. So what you're doing is you're giving me $100. You're giving me a bill for $100. I reach in my pocket and I pull out a $100 bill. And I give you a $100 bill. So now I paid you. No, no. I gave you a bill for $100. It's called a $100 bill. And if, and if, the, and if the charge was $20, then you give me a bill for $20. bucks. i will give you a $20 bill. So now you owe me $20. You owe me $100. Oh, I get it. Yeah, I didn't pay you nothing. I discharged the debt because I, I discharged it. I cut off the charge because now you owe me 100 I just gave you a bill for $100. It's called a $100 bill. And you think you got paid. No, no, it's a bill. You owe me. And since you owe me and I owe you, we're, just, we're even. So that's why, yeah. <laughs> That's why you don't own anything. Is it true Queen owns our IRS? Oh, yeah. Well, your, your body, your very, your very body is a security on the New York Stock Exchange. Did you know that? Each one of you is worth over $6.5 million on the New York Stock Exchange right now. Let me show you something. You got a $1 bill? Give me a $1 bill. I want to show you something. Thank you. On the Social Security card, back in 1868, after the Civil War, a group of men got together and formed a corporation. Well, anybody can form a corporation. Anybody. So this group of guys got together and they, called the, and they formed a corporation in Delaware. It's the Delaware Corporation. And they called the corporation the United States Corporation. And it was stipulated that anybody who would work for that corporation would be referred to as a citizen. So it's a United States corporation. And if you work for that corporation, you're a citizen. And so there today, when you walk in a bank or anywhere and they ask you, are you a U.S. citizen, you say yes. What you think they're asking you, are you lawfully in America to do business? They didn't ask you if you were lawfully in America. Like an attorney, listen to what they ask you. Because you're in court, be careful what you say before the judge when he says, are you a U.S. citizen? Because if you say yes, what you have said is that, yes, I am voluntarily of my own volition admitting that I am an employee of a foreign corporation called United States, which was incorporated as a Roman trust back in 1868, so that the United States is a privately owned company, like Ford Motor Company, General Motors, they're huge, they're big. Well, so is the U.S. government, but it's a privately owned corporation. And therefore, all corporations have to have a president. So we got a president. And, you, and corporate law says you have to have a vice president. So they got a vice president. And you also have to have a secretary treasurer. That's corporate law. So they got a secretary treasurer. It's a privately owned company, for God's sakes. It's like General Motors, Ford Motor Company, Sears, and the U.S. government. It's all corporate. It's a business. And consequently, your body is a security on the New York Stock Exchange because you're the security for what is referred to as the body social. That's why when you retire, you get social security because you are the security for the corporation. As long as you're doing your job and making money and paying them every year, you're good security. You know, you got money coming in. And so that's why you have to have a seat belt and, and the car, and you have to have insurance and a seat belt. Why? Because they love you and want to protect you? No, no, no. They own you. They own your body on the security on the New York Stock Exchange. So, then, and so if you get in a wreck, now they've got to pay you, for God's sakes. Now they've got to take care of you. No, no, they want you to pay them, Arahat, not them pay you. So... So they want you to protect yourself, and if you're going to be stupid and get in an accident, have insurance so the federal government will be paid for your stupidity of getting yourself in a wreck. So they get the insurance. So that's why you have to take care of yourself. I mean, once you understand how this works, well, anyway, this is a corporation. It's called the United States Corporation. It's privately owned. So if you think for one minute, I'm going to go to Vietnam and fight for Ford Motor Company, you've got another thing coming. No. 
for my country is a republic. Now that's different. But there's a world of difference between United States of America and United States. United States is a privately owned company. It's a corporation. The republic is different. It's a whole different world. So you need to understand how those different words are used. There's a world of difference between a trial by jury and a jury trial. Does it mean the same thing? There's a world of difference between California state and the state of California. Does it mean the same thing at all? So when you, there's a world of difference between a lawyer and an attorney. Does it mean the same thing at all? You need to understand words. Study the world of occult terms and knowledge that attorneys and lawyers know that you don't know. Again, this is a corporation. It was founded in 1868 called the United States Corporation, privately owned. And if you're a member of that corporation, like any corporation, you're naturally going to have an ID card. So if you're walking around the plant, they will be able to tell you to actually work for Ford, and here's your, here's your code numbers. And so this is your, your certificate number in the corporation. But on the back, you will see a set of numbers on the back. On mine, it's red. And normally, they're in red. Sometimes they're in black. Normally, the, the numbers on the back are in red. Why? It doesn't matter what color it is. It's what it represents. It's in red because it represents your blood. These numbers are your body on the New York Stock Exchange. So when you have a dollar bill on American money, you will see there's a code numbers on the bill. See the code numbers on the bill? When you put your numbers on the back of your Social Security card with the numbers on the bill, they're identical. Wow. So that your body is worth six and a half million on the stock exchange, and it is the security for America's money. Your body is a security uh, for the body social. That's why when you retire, you get social security. No, you are the security for the body of the corporation. And they are using your body on the New York Stock Exchange, and that's why this government has never cared about all the illegals coming in from Mexico. and They don't care about that at all. Why? Because the more the merrier. The more people that they get Social Security numbers on, that's six and a half million dollars more they just got. And so if they get 150,000 a day times, uh, times six and a half million, every day the government's making money off of people coming in. They couldn't care less where you come in. They want documented workers so they can document you to get the credit through the international banking cartels out of London to pay them for you because your body is a security on the New York Stock Exchange. So that's why there's never going to be any there will never be any stopping of the illegal. Because look at, if the, if the corporation called United States is a company, it's a corporation, and if you are doing something and making money, then and you are not paying them, they can put a lien on you. It's called a mechanic's lien. You know, if you have a painter and he paints your house and you don't pay him, he can put a mechanic's lien, meaning he goes to the bank and says, I'm putting a lien on this house because they owe me $6,000 and they won't pay me, which means you cannot do anything with that property until you pay him first. So if you want to sell the property first, but the first 6000 goes to this man because he has a lien on you because he did something for you and you didn't pay him. So therefore, if you're working in California, but you're not a, a U.S. citizen, you're not in the corporation, you become known as an alien because they have now put a lien on you. You are now an alien. No, you're not an alien. They have put a lien on you. <laughs> words. Magical. It's magical, the way words are used. You go to court. Why do you go to court? You play tennis on a court. You play basketball on a court. How do you play tennis on a court? You play with a racket. Come on. So, <laughs> No, serious. You think that these, these lawyers dream up this stuff by chance? No, 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 no. These guys are smart. They're playing a game. And you just don't know the game they're playing. So you're going to a court. The whole idea of a court is, is like I said, basketball court is a game. This team stands up and throws the ball back in the other guy's court. And that team of lawyers throws the ball back in this guy's court. And the judge just comes out, he's a referee because he's wearing a black robe. Black robes represent the planet Saturn, the lord of money and banking 
and law. Saturn was the god of banking and law. That's and his 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 priest of Saturn always wore black robes. That's why the Catholic Church wears a black robe. That's why the rabbis wear black robes. When you graduate from high school, you wear a black robe. The whole idea of, of the Saturnian is called Saturn. The god Saturn was lord of the rings. So women were told to listen to their god. So they would wear an ear ring because Saturn is the lord of the ring. And men were to get married before their god, so they wear a wedding ring. You need to understand there is a world of occultism, manipulation, exploitation of the human race with words and terms and symbols that you don't even know is happening right in front of you. So you've got a court. The whole idea in a court is, is a game to put the ball back in the other guy's court. And the judge is going to rule from the bench. The word bench is a Latin word for a bank. So he's ruling for the bank. Why? Because you're going to have to, somebody's going to have to pay their debt to society. Somebody's going to pay. When the day is over, somebody's going to lose and they're going to pay. And the judge doesn't care because he's getting paid anyway, so he doesn't care. He's a referee. That's why he wears a black robe. And when the judge walks out, everyone rises. Why? The same reason when a Catholic priest walks out, everyone rises. Because the Catholic Church operates under the same maritime admiralty law as a court in America. That's why in Catholic churches you always see three steps going to the altar. Those are the first three steps of the first degrees of Freemasonry. First, second, and third degree. Once you're on the third, you get in the third degree. Now you're going before the judge. It's the three degrees of Masonry. So then you, now, now you bring in the occult world of Freemasonry. All those secret societies, the Ninth Templars, the world bankers, the religious orders. All of this stuff is connected thousands of years ago that you don't know anything about. And once you start seeing how in court the judge rules from the, from the bench, which a bench is a Latin word for a bank, and where do you find banks if they're on both sides of a river? They're called river banks. What does a river bank do if it doesn't direct the flow of the current, see? Because your, your money is called current, see? Because it's the cash flow, the liquid assets, the juice. And either you got it or you don't. Money goes through your hands like water. No, money is water. Maritime admiralty. When a, and let me, uh, money, there are only two things on the earth. There's there are only two things on this globe. There's, there's land and water. So we have two kinds of law. The ancient Romans set this up, and they said we only have two kinds of law. The law of the land and the law of water. The law of the land is the custom of the people who live on a particular piece of land. That's always different. So the law of the land is different everywhere. You can do things in Russia you can't do here. Because the law of the land is different here. You can do things in South America you can't do in China. Because the law of the land is different. The people live on the land. So the law of the land is the law of the culture that lives on that piece of land. But the law of water? No, water is the same everywhere. The law of water is the law of money. It's called maritime admiralty. The law of money. So you can get a credit card in, in China and go to South Africa for vacation. It doesn't matter. We're just talking money now. And banks are banks all over the world. So we're just talking money. Either you got it or you don't. So it doesn't matter what color you are, what race. Do you have the money? You know, the credit card. So when you understand that the, the money is the law of, the, of water, let me give you an example of commerce in water. When a ship pulls into a harbor, a ship is always female. Always a ship is female by law. Um, sailing ship, rocket ship, doesn't matter. If it's a ship, it's female. Why? Because she delivers the product. Okay? Without her, you don't have any product. So she is, is, a, is a term which is used for all ships. And so when the ship pulls into a harbor, it pulls in with, say, $800 million worth of Toyotas. Uh, every one of those cars or televisions or whatever is coming in must have its own certificate of manifest because yesterday the ship wasn't here. This morning they come to work and there's a ship here with $800 million worth of TVs. So it has manifested. So on the ship she brought in $800 million worth of business. So she came in on water. Well, where the ship parks is at the dock. And where the ship sits is called its berth. She is sitting in her berth, right? And she is producing uh, a maritime admiralty product 
because she came in on water. So therefore, each product has to have its own certificate of manifest because she is giving birth to a, pro to a, to a product. So therefore, when you were born, you came out of your mother's water. Her water broke. And by law, you are considered a maritime admiralty product. She delivered you in the delivery room. She delivered the product. And so you came out of water. You are a maritime admiralty product, so you have to have a birth certificate. And the birth certificate's got to be signed by the dock, because that's where the ship is sitting at the dock. So once you understand the words and the terms, and if you're born dead, if you're still born, then they just lost the TV. Because they take your car off and it falls down. Yeah. And so you got to, uh, if you on the car, on the television, whatever it is, how much does it weigh? What color is it? You know, does it have air conditioning? Is it two-door or four-door? Is it Mexican or is it, uh, is it uh, 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 some other race of people? How much does it weigh? Does he have both eyes? Yes. Yeah. The other five fingers? Yes. And how much does he weigh? What color is he? Those are all the vital signs for a maritime admiralty product. Because for, God, for God's sake, they're going to sell you. They want to know, does this kid have two feet or what? Because if he doesn't, I've got to have to pay for it. So, I... <laughs> so you are a maritime admiralty product. And therefore, you are being bought and sold around the world today. And if you could get your original birth certificate back, the original, not the, not the certified copy. Get the original one back. You will see on all birth certificates at the bottom, this, this is a security document that goes directly to the Department of Commerce. And from the Department of Commerce, they put that directly out into the stock market of New York City, and now people are buying and selling your, your body. And you don't even know it. You're worth six and a half to seven million dollars right now, and you didn't even know it on the New York Stock Exchange. But this is the, the, the type of stuff that most people don't know anything about, and there's a reason why most people have never heard of any of this, because it doesn't have anything to do with football. It's got nothing to do with silly-ass sports and basketball and all that other <laughs> silly-ass stuff that kids love to play. You know, that's what you've always give the kids, a ball. Tell the kids who want to play ball. I don't care what ball, basketball, <laughs> ping-pong ball, football, golf ball. I don't care. Get the damn kid out of here and let him go play with a ball. Give the kid and he'll go out and play ball. That's why they have the president of the United States. He goes out and throws the first ball because daddy's out playing ball with us. You know, while all the kids are out there, all the schmucks are out there watching the ball game. And daddy's out there with the senators and the congressmen. They're watching the ball game. I want to know what these freaks are doing at 2 o'clock in the morning that they haven't told us. I want to know about their boyfriends and all the money that's changing hands and all the shit that's really going on. That's, the, that's where the name of the tune is. When you find out that these guys who are running the planet are playing us for a bunch of fools, let them go out and play ball. And send some movie stars, send some of them chumps that we own, send them out there and let them get, be on TV so you can see on the basketball games they'll always show Jack Nicholson and some big movie stars at the, at the ball game. Because that keeps all the schmucks uh, interested to go out with the movie stars and watch a ball game. Not me. I'm not going to any ball game. I wanna, I'm going to an education at UCLA. I want to know who's running this country, how it works, who set up our government, who gave us our religions, where these religions come from. The whole idea of Christianity is nothing more than sun worship. I mean, who, the sun is our risen savior. Of course the sun is your risen savior. God's sun is our, well, you don't own the sun. Africa doesn't own the sun. So who owns the sun? Well, obviously God owns the sun. Well, then it's God's sun. And God's sun is the light of the world. Of course the sun's the light of the world. What, else, what the hell else lights the earth if it isn't the sun? <laughs> So God's son lights the world. He's the light of the world. He's our risen savior. Of course it's your risen savior. If it doesn't rise, you're dead in six weeks. So wait till it don't come up. And you'll see it is your savior. And the sun, the Egyptians said, the sun gives off energy. And energy is life. That's why you have, a life, you have the life of a battery. When the battery goes dead, it's no energy. So the Egyptians said the sun is pure energy. And it's giving its energy so that we might live. So God's son is giving his life that you might live. Of course the son is giving his life. It's giving its energy so that you can grow and the plants can grow. And once you begin to understand religion, where it comes from, the whole story of Jesus is nothing more than a metaphor. There was no Jesus. There was no Abraham, no Isaac, no Jacob. There was no Moses, no King Solomon. None of those people in the Bible ever lived. 
These are metaphors for something far deeper that the ancient writers were trying to tell you in a metaphor. There's a symbolic story. And if you don't get the symbolism, you will go for your whole life in trouble because you didn't know how to read the symbols. You don't know what's really going on behind the scenes. You drive down through Los Angeles to see all the spray painting on walls. You think there's a bunch of kids destroying property. No, no, no. Those symbols mean something. If you don't know what they mean, you better stay out of the territory because they're telling you. If you come in here as a different particular race, that symbols mean we're going to kill you. And so if you're going on a bicycle ride in China, you better learn the Chinese symbols because you're going to get killed if you don't know how to read the symbols. And that's what most people don't know anything about how this world really, in fact, works. But once you figure out how the courts work, education works, education is nothing more than a 12-step program. Let me give you an example. And the ancient Egyptian religion, one of the many different religions in Egypt, the ancient Egyptian religion of Horus. Horus was the sun in its rising. He was a god, God the sun. And Horus was spelled H-O-R-U-S. And Horus walked across the sky in 12 steps. It was a 12-step program. That's why alcoholics have a 12-step program. You have a 12-step program. You go to the first grade to the 12. It's a 12-step program. Then you graduate which is two words, gradually indoctrinate. You put them together, it becomes graduate. So for the 12-step program, they have finally taught you what to kiss and when and how to get a, yeah, and how to get a job and, what, and, who to, and who to bow down to and all that. So they've taught you now, and now you can go out and get a job. It's the 12-step program, first to the 12th grade. What is that based on? Horus. Horus was our god, the, the sun, the sun god in Egypt. He walked across the sky in 12 steps. Horus of the first step, Horus of the second step, Horus of the third step. When he got in the Horus of the sixth step, he was directly overhead. He was then called Horus, the most high God, because you don't get any higher than noon. So it's called high noon because he's the most high. Why? Well, because after one o'clock, the sucker's going down. <laughs> so, so he was the most high at 12 noon. And so Horus walks across his 12 steps. So we say the same thing today. Same thing. We have 12 Horuses. But instead of H-O-R-U-S, we make it H-O-U-R-S. Becomes ours, changing the U and the R. Now it becomes 12 hours. No, it's 12 Horuses. And Horus represents light. The sun represents light. Light in Latin is Lucius. Lucius, when personified as a god, becomes Luke. And this is why you have Luke Skywalker. And he walks across the sky and meets his evil brother, Darth Vader, or in the Egyptian religion, Set. He was the god of darkness. The prince of darkness was Set. Why? Because it got dark. It's unset. So the whole idea is that it's the whole world that we live in is based on Egypt, Mesopotamia, ancient Greece, ancient Rome. All of the stuff that we live in this world is based on ancient religions and cults and secret societies and Masonic orders, and the people of this world have no idea in the world what's going on. I've spent 48 years studying occultism, mysticism, words, terms, legal terms, government, international banking, theology, religions. I'm telling you, there's a world of knowledge you have never been told. That's been right there for you, but it just never occurred to anyone to sit down for 48 years and study this stuff in the dark. I mean, the, the, I have a high respect for all religions, for all belief systems. But I'm telling you, it needs to be based on wisdom and knowledge. Let me give you an example in the Old Testament. In Arabia, in Arabia, looking east, there's a huge mountain range in Arabia, very high mountain ranges in Arabia, in the middle of Arabia. And so the Arabian people on this side, looking east, every night the moon would come out of the mountain. The moon would rise in the east, and it comes up behind the mountains. So the ancient Arabians, talking about thousands of years ago, they believed the moon was a god. It was a moon god. And obviously he lived in a mountain. That's obvious because every night he comes up from the mountain. So he lived in a mountain, and his name, the name of the moon god in Arabia was Sin, S-I-N, Sin. And a mountain in the ancient Arabic, a very ancient language, was Ai. It's translated Ai. Ai is a mountain in the ancient language. So the god Sin lived in his mountain, Ai. You put them together, it becomes Sinai. 
No, there was no cyanide. There's a god sin in the mountain called Ai. Airhead, wake up. It's just the worship of a moon god. This is why the Jews have their celebration out to sundown, because that's when the moon god comes out. They're not going to have their, 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 their holy days in the daytime. That's when the Christians are worshiping the sun. But God said, you don't want to have your holy days when they're worshiping the sun on Sunday with the Christians who are worshiping the sun. The Jews are worshiping the moon. So we wait till after sundown. Then we have our holy days. It's because of the moon God comes out and it's in Sinai. And, you know, and God, I could go on for hours explaining where these concepts and ideas have come from. That's why if you go to Israel and you go to a synagogue, it's not spelled S Y N, spelled S I N, synagogue. Because sin is the God of the moon, Ogog, which is, we get from that, uh, the Gog and Magog or Argog. Sin Agog is the house of the, of the worship of the god Sin, Sin Agog. S I N, not S Y N. So I'm just. Huh? Look to see if you have big, long, all day seminars. Oh, yeah, I could sit and talk for days on this stuff. <laughs> days, several days. That'd be great. Yeah. That'd be great. I could sit and talk for days yeah. on, on this subject of religion, theology, uh, where all of these things have come from. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know, well, where did you get this document or that document? Where, where can we read about this or that? Well, what I've done is I have uh, downloaded, give me that, uh, that DVD. What I've done is I have, uh, thank you, I have downloaded all my files in one computer. I've got about three or four of them, but in one computer I have all my text, dial, text documents, PDFs and all that. So what I've done is I've just downloaded all of my documents from my computer into a DVD. It's like, I don't know, 5,080 different items, 161 different subjects, 3.4 gigs of documents on religion, government, courts, just the crap of the world, everything. Everything is going on. It's all here. There's all the documents are all here. And you find out where all this stuff really comes from and the worship of Saturn. And Saturn was in the old Phoenician language. In the ancient area, what we call Israel and Lebanon today was called Phoenicia. And in the old Phoenician world, they were worshippers of the planet Saturn. So when the Hyksos people that we call Hebrews today, in, I, 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 incidentally, the word Hebrew is a derogatory term. It's like calling a Mexican a wetback. It's not a very nice term. And so, and, and so calling someone a Hebrew is not, it's a derogatory term. And incidentally, the Jewish yarmulke, that's not, it's not Jewish at all. That's Roman. That's why the, the Holy Father wears the yarmulke. The, the cardinals wear the yarmulke. Rome was here before Jews. And so under the Roman Empire, the Jews were ordered to show, show respect for the Holy Father. Or we're going to cut your head off. So you show respect for the Holy Father, you are under the Holy Father. So you show respect by wearing the yarmulke. So today we've got Jews running around with yarmulkes thinking it's Jewish. Not Jewish. It's Roman. The entire system of religion is Roman. The white man's world has dominated the earth with religion. And the Jews think that, they're, that they are a, a monotheistic religion. No, not monotheistic. Henotheistic. Christians think that they've got a, a, a corner on the truth and they don't realize it's just worshiping the sun. Let me give you an example. We got a couple of moments. Let me give you an example. I want to try and understand what I'm saying here. All of the religious concepts and ideas in Christianity and Judaism come from the northern hemisphere. We don't have anything in our Christianity or Judaism that comes from the uh, from the Aztecs or the Mayas or the uh, Aborigines of Australia. All of our concepts and ideas come from the northern hemisphere. Very good reason. Because the whole thing of religion and Judaism and Christianity is astrology. It's based on the stars. That's what God is. Ask any kid where God is. He's out there. That's right, in the stars. That's what the Christianity and Judaism is based on, the stars. <clears throat> and so, on the first day of summer, the very first day of summer, the sun is as high in the northern hemisphere as it's going to go. It's not going any further north than the first day of summer. Each day after the first day of summer, it begins to move one degree southward every day. It's so slight, you'll never notice it. But, six, but 90 degrees later, or 90 days later, which is three months later, it's halfway down. 
So when he was high in the northern hemisphere, he started summer. And summer begins in the constellation of Leo. He was the Lion King, like Disney's Lion King. The Lion King is the sun in the constellation of Leo that begins summer. The Lion King. The Lion of the tribe of Judah. It's Leo, the constellation of Leo in summer. The sun is hot. So he's the Lion King. Leo, the constellation. Now, 90 degrees later, 90 days later, he is falling. So now it's called fall. Yeah, because he was really hot. Now he's falling. So he's not that hot anymore. So now we call it fall because he's falling. What is the symbol for fall if it isn't Scorpio, the backbiter? And this is why in the old ancient world, when a scorpion bites you, they have two stingers, one on top of the other. And when they, when they hit you, it looks like two lips. And then so the ancient people said, you just got the kiss of death. He just kissed you off. Because you just got bit by a scorpion, and that's the kiss of death. That's why the mafia gives you a kiss of death. That's where it comes from. So Scorpio is the backbiter. He's the one that goes behind your back and rats on you, and he's the backbiter and causes you to die. And that's what Judas was, the backbiter, Scorpio, because Scorpio begins fall. So Jesus, who was the son of God, the God's son, the light of the world, he was the lion king in summer, but now he is falling. And so Judas is the backbiter who has now kissed him off. And now he's going to go all the way south, down to south, and, 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 uh, and die in Capricorn. When he goes all the way down south, he stops on December 21, no, December 22nd. On December 22nd, the sun hits the lowest uh, degree on the, on the earth, and it doesn't go any further south than December 22nd. On the 23rd and 24th, the sun rises on the exact same degree. The U.S. Navy has instruments that can show you it did not move northward or southward, but for three days, it stayed on December 22nd, 23rd, and 24th on the same degree. So the ancient Egyptians said the sun was moving all along, and it's, you know, anything that's moving every day is alive, but now for three days, God's son is dead in his grave. He's dead. He's not moving. Then on December 25th, the sun moves one degree northward, which means it is now beginning its annual journey back to the northern hemisphere. So now we celebrate his born again. He's come back. After all, he said he would return. Well, he's out, the 20, 25th, and move one degree. That means he's alive. As he comes back over the equator to the northern, uh, the northern part of the earth, as he passes over the equator, the ancient Egyptians celebrated spring. And they said that the sun, uh, you know, we say today when, when someone dies that they passed away, or grandmother passed last night, or they passed on. Past means they died. The Egyptians said that God's son, who was the light of the world, has died for three days. But he has come back to life, December 25th, Christmas. We celebrate God's son's birthday. Yeah, the son's birthday. And as it comes back across the equator, we celebrate what is called spring, because now he is springing back to life. And so as it passes over the equator, the ancient Egyptians celebrated something called the Passover. Because in the first week of spring, it passes over the equator. So it became known as the Passover. And so today we have Jews uh, celebrating the Passover, which is the sun in spring passing over the equator. Well, the Christians have got to do the same thing, but, but they don't want to have anything to do with the Jewish religion, for God's sakes. I mean, what would that look like? So they wouldn't have anything to do with the Jewish religion. So they have the Christian religion, which is the actual truth. And in the real truth, uh, it's the resurrection, we say, of God's son. The resurrection. And I said, what the hell are you talking about, resurrection? It came back to life. It's a resurrection. It's a Passover. Well, get out, you know, get a life. It's just the sun passing over the equator, for God's sake. You know that better than anybody else. It's all worship of the sun. And so that's why in, in the Middle Ages and in the Middle uh, East, in uh, what we call Phoenicia, Cana, Egypt, they had a celebration in, in celebrating Easter, or what we call Easter. And it's actually Ishtar. Ishtar is the, is the goddess who comes back, Ishtar. And so we celebrate her coming back. She's coming back to life. And as it passes over the equator, we equate that sun passing over the, uh, over the equator with Virgo, the virgin. So God's son is now born of a virgin. Yeah, Virgo, the virgin. And uh, 
You know, that's why Leonardo da Vinci, when he painted the Last Supper, and he has 12 apostles, the three and three, three and three. There are four groups of three. Yes, yeah, spring, summer, autumn, winter. Get a life. And the sun's in the middle, and the sun's in the middle. This is why there's a 12 apostles plus the God's son is 13. 13 is an unlucky number. It goes into masonry. Uh, I could explain this whole thing. and uh, There's so much to tell you. I don't even know where the hell to start with this stuff. <laughs> I could go on for hours explaining how the Masons knew that they were going to overthrow the existing government in America in 1776. Because in, in, in ancient Hebrew theology, eight was the number of new beginnings. Eight. If you call for a cab, there's one out there. Uh, anyway. Oh, in the Hebrew, uh, th uh, ancient Hebrew theology, eight, the number eight was the number of new beginnings. You start things over on an eight. So uh, uh, eight was the only number, eight was the only number that you can continue to draw without picking your pen up, without picking a pencil up, because it goes on forever. So therefore you lay an eight down, it becomes infinity, and go on for, uh, forever. So eight is the number of new beginnings, and 13 was in ancient philosophy, 13 was a perfect number for government. Perfect number is God's son with his chosen 12. That's a perfect government. 12 apostles with their master of the son is perfect government. So the Masons decided they were going to have their revolution against England according to the astrological symbols. They knew what they were doing. So they said the revolution must happen in 1776 and it must happen in July because of the constellations that will be visible in the heavens in July will facilitate the revolution. They knew astrology. So they had their revolution in 1776, which is 1 and 7 is 8, and 7 and 6 is 13. So it's the perfect government based on the perfect number of 8 is new beginnings, beginning of something anew, and 7 and 6 is 13, a new government. So the Masons overthrew the British Empire. They knew they had to do it in 1776, and they had to do it at a particular point where the constellations were over the United States. It's a fascinating study of how the people who run this planet... 9-11 is simply a, 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 a gimmick to scare the PWADs out of everybody so that you will not bow down on your knees and ask the government to protect you. That's all it is. Adolf Hitler did the same thing. He burned the Reichstag down. He had his own guys go out and burn the, the, the government building down to scare the hell out of everybody. And he said, I can't do anything about these people are crazy. They're burning down the government. They're killing people. The only thing I can do is if you tell me to, I can do anything because I'm just a humble man. But if you tell me to do something, I've got to do it, then I'm, I'm obliged. So everybody said, well, you've got to protect us. Well, if I've got to protect me, the only way I can protect you is, is, is give me absolute power to be God. Well, we'll give you all the power. Do anything you need to protect us. Yeah, that's what I wanted. You chumps are stupid. That's what I wanted. That's why I paid the guys to go out and blow down the building so that you would give me the power to be God. Now that I got the power to be God, you're going to prison. That's the way these people work. They are tricksters. Do you think 2012 will be exploited? No, I don't think. 2012 is not important to me. It's just a calendar day. It's like, say, it's like saying to me, what do you think is going to happen on December 31st at midnight? I think it's going to change to a different year, so what? That and $2 will get you a cup of coffee. Nothing's going to happen. Anyway, i got to go, and so if you're interested in uh, the documents I'm talking about, all the stuff I'm talking about are in documents right there, so we only have a few more minutes, so if you want to get them, you better get them now. Thank you. Thank you.